Maybe you've noticed this. Maybe you haven't. Maybe this will come as a shock to you, but everything changes in the world. Every day, believe it or not, you're faced with those changes and how you react to them determines a lot about the style of life that you have, the choices you make in how you react to the circumstances that come upon you in change or how you adapt to those changes and rearrange your lifestyle in order to be a part of that change or that process of development that happens to you. Every day, whether you know it or not, somewhere in the world there's some catastrophic event going on. Something that nobody expected, nobody planned for, they weren't quite ready. We have what we call first responders, people who are specially designed in order to run into any given situation and to know what to do when it happens. Those first responders are sometimes taught first aid, they're taught how to deal with stress, they're taught how to eliminate or how to coordinate the outer perimeter of a certain disaster area so that there is not more disasters happening. In other words, like you don't run into a burning building unless you first look at the burning building and see if it's going to fall down on you. That's just common sense. Well, a lot of people, unfortunately, in those given catastrophic events aren't thinking clearly, so they're not trained or taught to be a first responder. They're more reactive than active in knowing what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Christians are first responders. You may not have known that, but we're called to be the first responders. We're called to know that our assurances aren't in the circumstances of life. That life itself doesn't dictate what we do. Matter of fact, often the circumstances of life we look at as opportunities to reveal what God would do. As a matter of fact, that old book, What Would Jesus Do?, is kind of a fun realization that you are the answer to any given situation. You have God inside you. Now, you may not have been trained yet, possibly, to be that first responder, but that's who you are. Your nature that God has given you is supernatural, so to speak. It is beyond the things that most people can see. As a matter of fact, you have a peace that passes all understanding, so when a crisis comes, non-Christians are looking at you to see how will you react? How are you going to deal with a crisis in your life? What will happen to you when catastrophic events come into your life? You see, everyone wants to find a hero. Everyone likes to believe in the heroic. But the reality of what faith is, is the demonstration of who God is in a given situation where the circumstances dictate other actions, where the person actually puts their confidence in someone whom they know personally and have actively participated in an experience that for them it's as easy as night and day as flipping on a switch. They automatically do the right thing in those circumstances. They have a peace with God. They have a peace of God. They have a peace that passes all understanding. When you have that peace, when God has given that to you by way of His Holy Spirit, which is cultivated by studying the Word of God, by having a lifestyle that has been grown with knowing Jesus in a personal and intimate way, then you find as all these circumstances came upon you as you were being developed by God, that it was just a learning experience. You didn't treat it as though it were some catastrophic event. You didn't treat it as though it were something, oh no, to be feared. You treated it as, well, okay Lord, what are you going to do? What do you want me to do and what are you going to do? So you always saw it as an opportunity for God to reveal himself. And God did. And as you built upon that experience, you became God's man of the hour. You became the person who stood in the gap. You became the person born for such a time as this. You are God's responder, the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Now, not all Christians really 
are first responders. Should they be? Yeah, but you know, sometimes they're probably as much the problem because they panic as they are the result of an answer that should be presented. Sometimes they overreact rather than act according to God's will. They act in their own will. And for those, they aren't really first responders or God's responders. They're more like just the people caught up in the moment and dictating by their feelings what actions they're doing. That's never the right course of action for us. We are always told to go to God in every circumstance or situation of life. In everything, we're told to give thanks. But more than that, we're told, according to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, to trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning on our own understanding, in all our ways, in everything, to seek Him. Because God said that if any man like wisdom, let him ask God who it not, but gives all men liberty. In other words, whenever you don't know what to do, you're supposed to ask God in order to know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. We're not supposed to just take in this Bible and stick it in our brain and say, oh, well, you know, according to these principles from the Bible, according to this ethos from the Bible, according to the ethics of my interpretation of the Scripture, according to my theology, according to my dogma, according to my tradition, according to my application or my exegetical study, or according to my anything, I'm going to act. False. That's not what you do. You see, whenever you apply that kind of mentality, it's all mental. It's an intellectual response to a given set of circumstances that says, hey, this isn't unique. This is something that uh, always happens the same. So I'm always going to have the same response. I'm always going to have the same answer. Well, in one way, that's true. Ask God. Because, you see, there's more to circumstance than just what you see. There's more to life than what you experience. There's more to what's going on than what you think about. As a matter of fact, God says, what you think about is probably the worst thing you could do because your thoughts are my thoughts and you don't even know what I have planned. So because God is intervening directly in every circumstance of life, we are told to trust Him. Now, you may not trust Him and you may have to figure out some of the other scriptures that apply of why you should trust Him and how you can trust Him and why it's so easy to trust Him because you are a first responder. But we who have become those that are first responders recognize that we don't have anything of ourselves to give. We're not the smartest people in the world, and we're not the brightest people in the world. But we are the people who have the right answer at the right time, because we know where to go for the answer. And the answer is in Jesus. If we don't go and ask Him, though, if we don't go and seek Him to do His will, if we don't ask Him in every circumstance that comes up in our life, whether it be major or minor, then really, we're either obedient or disobedient according to the will of God in any given circumstance or situation whenever the timing is such that God says, look, what are you doing right now? Did I tell you to? Or did I share with you my heart, my love, my will? Because you see, Jesus in his life for three and a half years did only those things that were pleasing to his Father. Now that's a pretty bold claim, except for the Father himself said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Interesting. Whether you choose to have that confirmation from God himself, the Father, or whether you have that boldness to say, like Jesus did, I'm only doing those things that please the Father, that type of lifestyle was developed by Jesus in communication cooperation and direct interaction with God himself. That is why we have peace. If you have the peace of God that passes all understanding, you have communication with God our Father. 
You communicate one-to-one -one with him on a daily basis. You cooperate with what he tells you to do. If he says, go to the left, you go to the left. If you go to the right, you go to the right. If he says, be still, you be still. If he says, stand and see the salvation I bring, you don't get your hands involved at all. You wait on the Lord. Often, I'm given many circumstances and situations where people tell me, well, you got to do this, or you got to do that. And I always say, I don't got to do anything. What I choose to do is to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I have a choice, and every man, woman, and child living in this universe has the freedom of choice. Even the angels in heaven had the choice, and they made it. And we're judged. Likewise, we as created beings by God our Father have a choice. The choice is whether to obey or disobey. The choice is whether to follow what he says or do what he says or not. The choice is to be walking with God or be in conflict with God. You see, when you're in conflict with God, things don't work out quite the way you thought they would. They don't happen the way that God said they would. They don't go according to his plan. They're going according to your learning process. And when you go off on a tangent, you're kind of out of kilter and out of touch with what God wants to accomplish in you, for you, and with you. When you aren't in that communication, cooperation, and filling of the Holy Spirit, so to speak, it's a conflict of interest when you're doing something that God hasn't told you specifically to do. And you know what that's like because we all at times have done it. Unless we don't trust ourselves completely and then we just go, man, I ain't making a move until I talk to God. <laughs> and I don't trust myself, so guess what? That's what I do. And I still blow it. But the point being is that when you know that you need to seek Him, then you know where you have the answer. As He said, to trust in Him and to ask Him for wisdom. So, whenever life is overwhelming, you're not. Whenever catastrophic events create an environment of fear and trembling, you're not. Whenever death comes knocking at your door and people panic over what you will do, you're not fearful. The reason being is because God has said, I'm with you. God has said, I will provide for you. God has said, I will take care of you. God has made so many provisions for us, including the death and the resurrection of His only begotten Son. The reality of our own doubts is stupid. The bottom line of our own fears is faithlessness, is really ignorance. When we finally get to the bottom line of the rubber meets the road, the greatest time of our lives should be those times when we don't know what to do and we look forward to seeing what God will come through with. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makes me to dwell in safety. Did you know that there's huge industries about having security? You know, security in your possessions, security in your life, you know, security in preventing fire so you get fire insurance, prevention of flood so you get flood insurance, prevention of theft so you get theft insurance. And then also, in order to really get assurance of confidence that you're in safety, you go out and you get alarm systems and cameras and, you know, all the other things that go with it. A lot of people buy guns in order to think that they feel safe. Huh. Really. That's really an interesting way of looking at it, I guess. Or they think that somehow if we get lots of armies throughout the world, you know, we can feel safe and protected. And yet, one minute of one second of one day you could walk out on the street and get hit by a car. And that doesn't really protect you from all the catastrophes that could happen, does it? 
Your insurance only gives you the assurance that it takes care of something that you are planning about financially, but it has nothing to do with really safety. Your only confidence can come in the Lord in whom you trust. Because if you're trusting in any other means of protection or safety or assurance, I can tell you this. Beyond your comprehension, God in some way will allow that confidence in man to be destroyed, whether it be by losing an object of your affection, either a loved one or a possession, or in some way God tear down that stronghold you thought were you thought you were so good with your gun that you forgot to unlock it or you forgot to lock it one day and your child killed himself or someone else used it in the commission of a crime. You see, there's always consequences to actions. And you may not like what you do when you take up the sword and Jesus said, die by the sword. It doesn't work out always the way you think it will. But when you have safety in God, when you have trust in Him, then you will both lay down in peace and sleep, confident. For the Lord only makes you to dwell in safety. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou rest. Even as a hen gathers her chick... You know, it's interesting. Even as I'm reading this, I was thinking, you know, it was fascinating this morning. I got up, I looked out my window, and there were ten turkeys. No, I mean, really. I'm in the big city of Sacramento, and there were ten turkeys in the parking lot. And they were, like, running after these crows. They ran into the parking lot after these crows. Then they ran over the building, you know, into this one part of it and chasing another crow. And it was kind of hilarious because the last thing you expect to see in a normal metropolitan area, which basically is what the Sacramento area is, although, you know, everybody has nowadays green belts and, you know, unimproved areas and, you know, suburbs and things like that, but you really don't expect to see ten turkeys <laughs> running through a parking lot. <laughs> it, it was a little interesting, you know, it was kind of cute. Because my wife and I, we had lived in another apartment complex, and I think it was a horse or something that got loose, or a llama, or I can't even remember what it was, but some animal, and it wound up in the swimming pool. And that was hilarious. It was on the news, and they asked to interview my wife, and she, terrified of cameras, said, no, 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 she didn't want to. But it was interesting this morning that we're talking about birds, you know, and suddenly it just came to my mind, that's right, what about those ten turkeys? <laughs> and even now, as I was sharing, you know, the Word of God, you know, and sharing this devotional, I saw in the shadow that's on the ground, you know, my hummingbird come by again. You know, he just choo, flitting by, you know, and you can see him in the shadow, you know, so I just kind of kept going. But, you know, God does that. He interrupts our lives to remind us how enjoyable, really, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, life can really be. You don't have to fear things that are coming upon the world, whether it be the end of the world or the economy, whether it be a loss of a job or loss of a loved one. There's still life going on all around you. If you just have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit of God might be showing you or revealing to you, like ten turkeys. It made absolutely no sense to me. You know, ten turkeys go tripping through a parking lot, you know, just checking out the, you know, grounds and, you know, chasing crows. I mean, that was kind of the, well, crows, ravens. That was kind of the hilarious part was that they were on a purpose. <laughs> I mean, that one, there was one big turkey, you know, probably the male, but. He'd start after that that raven, you know, and uh, sure enough, all nine of them would run as fast as they could after him too. You found out real fast how fast a turkey can run when you watch them chase that bird. <laughs> well, they chased one off, and then they chased another one off. It was kind of like, well, that's interesting. It was like, guess what? Thanksgiving's coming. There's ten turkeys. <laughs> A little sidelight, you know, people think that I'm so structured, I guess. Guess what? I've never been structured in my life. Praise the Lord. 
But he will not suffer your foot to be moved, but he that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord is your helper, and the Lord is your shade upon your right hand. I will abide in your tabernacle forever, for I will trust in the covert of thy wings. The darkness hides not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto you. He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with us also freely give us all things? You are Jesus's, and Jesus is God's. I will trust and not be afraid. I have angst at times. You know, angst, A-N-G-S-T. I have unctions at times. You know, U-N-C-T-I-O-N-S. My angst is as close as I come to fretting or worrying, and my unctions are as close as I come to patterns of behavior or doing things in a certain way. And my unctions and my angst sometimes war against themselves because sometimes I kind of go, you know, I really want to do this, but God sometimes interrupts it with turkeys. Or I have a worry or a concern and God interrupts it with, you know, like a hummingbird fly by. And it's always humorous because I know who's doing it. <laughs> Whenever I start to have any kind of unrealistic concern, God always brings something realistic in my life physically to, at that moment, coordinate the focus of my attention back onto Him. And that's why Christians are supposed to be trusting in Him, so that they know how to respond to God in any given situation. I've always been in the midst of either gang warfare is going on or some guy getting in my face and screaming and you know looking like he's going to you know, beat the crap out of me and I just don't bother because, you know, it's like I'm looking at him eye to eye and we're nose to nose and, you know, I just talk to them and they usually don't take a swing. You know, they don't bother and they don't have a feeling as though I'm going to attack them, but they definitely are going to attack me, but God somehow takes care of it. I even had a pastor one time, which blew my mind, come right at me and big man and you know was fist pulled together you know and was screaming at me you know nose to nose you know which that's pretty close in your face and you know God made me and allowed me just to cry because you know I cared about the pastor because after all he was a pastor and I was amazed that this person could have such an unrealistic attitude actions and choice of words and direction of what he was saying and doing and it just if anything made me cry more for who he was than who he should have been even though it's just a momentary failure of his own personality but in those circumstances every time that I've had whether it be a gun in my face or you know things happening around me you know that unless the Lord allows it it wasn't going to happen except that God had allowed it or you suffered the consequences of your own actions but the point even then if you're suffering consequences from what you've done God allows it for a purpose God allows it for design and me myself though I have suffered pain at times I know that I won't die until God wants me home so you don't really fear death anymore so you pretty much have a confidence of hey, you know, shoot me. See if I care. I'm going home. <laughs> you kind of get to a place where it's like, you're pretty ambivalent. You know, well, great. You know, if I, if I have prosperity, then I enjoy it. If I have poverty, I still enjoy it. If I have blessings, I enjoy it. If I have curses, I rejoice in them. Because in all things, I will give thanks to God. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you according to what we're told. So, I enjoy reminding people that you are the answer. Now, you may not feel like it sometimes with your own problems, but you know what? You are the answer, to put it bluntly, for someone else's situation. You just haven't realized it yet.